It's a little bit dark, but there's the kitty that I made my little shelter for. And he's a beautiful cat. Hello, babies. Oh, he's gorgeous. He's finally gotten to the point where he trusts me. And he lets me pet him while I feed him. He knows where the food's coming from. We're becoming friends. Oh, he is a gorgeous tomcat. I think he's a tom kitty. But hello, beautiful. What you doing, kitty? Oh, that's good food, isn't it? I've been feeding him, and he is so healthy. I feed him just at sunset. That's when he comes around. He disappears for the rest of the day. So anyway, my cat shelter is working out outstanding, so... Okay, it's time to get to the chess videos now. Let's get going, man. All right, you wonderful chess heathens of the world, unite! We're here doing another Backyard Professor chess video. Another training game, because I need it worse now than I ever have before from some of the comments I've heard in some of my other chess training videos. Thank you for commenting. Uh, here is another training game where I play the black. And this, this particular rating is at 1380. And I've been recommended to do it at 1600. I want to try about 10 of them to see if I can even compete with it. I will probably show you several training games where I end up losing because I cannot beat this thing at 1600. There's not a chance. No way. But it's okay because we learn from our losses. <laughs> Easy to say, right? Here's a game at 1380 that I want to show you how uh, to think about the imbalances and what we're looking for on the board and all that. At least I am. Uh, you guys are probably looking for far better stuff than I am. And so, sometimes I wonder, there can't be any possible way any of these videos are helping anybody. Even me. <laughs> we shall see, huh? Here we go. Okay. So, d6, and he comes up to knight f3, and I do a knight f6. And then he does a d3, and I do a c5. And then he castles, so we're having an early castling situation. And I pull up my other knight, and he pulls up his other knight, and then I come to BE6, and apparently that signals him already he's going to start attacking. Now, we know there are players that do this. Well, I mean, we, we have these in our games all the time. In my opinion, that's a premature second move. Sincerely, uh, you're not you're not ready to begin excursions on attacking yet. Now maybe he was attempting to induce a weakness here. I don't know. I don't know. But there's one thing for dang certain. I don't want to lose my good bishop. Period. So I'm forced also, in my opinion to move the bishop back, right? Which is annoying as I'll get out, but that's the way it works. And now watch. Now this one is another second move to h5. I'm thinking, holy cats, I don't want to take him with the knight because then the queen will take him, right? And that just doesn't appeal to me, having a queen down here. I've been through enough silliness of that caliber that I'm going to just prevent this right now. So what's he do? He induces a weakness on my king's side. The daddy rat. The daddy little skunk. So I pushed g6. And he cowered out. And I thought he should have took it and showed what a man he was. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, a guy can dream, right? So... I bump my queen to c8 because that aligns me with the bishop and that can be a powerful combo against the king side. Yes, in my opinion. Just my opinion. He pushes his bishop to e2 and I bring mine up to e7 preparing to castle. 
And then he brings his knight to c4. Okay, very most interesting. Now, and here we go. Check this out. I decide I've had enough, and I'm really creating weaknesses on my king's side here. I understand that. Knight f3. Now, I'm doing knight g4, so the hypocrisy was never, ever better shown. No, not in all of Israel. Because now I'm making second moves, right? <laughs> hey, it's the fun of being the backyard professor. I can be a chump, you know? So he comes back to knight a3. <sighs> I know, I know. I'm going to have to bump this thing up to do better training, right? Because th that's useless. So it gave me a free move, more or less. But I still get to practice seeing patterns, uh, coordinating my pieces and all that. Now, what do you think I'm going to do here? I'm going to go ahead and take the outpost. I went to knight d4. Now, see, pure hypocrisy. Here we are again. That's the second knight that I've moved two moves before I am fully developed. Oh, what a coward. However, I'm only missing one rook. And I do put him to work in this game. So, let's just stay calm before you clobber me for total hypocrisy here. He comes up to c4. The center is firmly locked. Yes, I go ahead and castle. And he takes the outpost. Yeah, I kind of figured that was going to be exchanged. Really, realistically, if you have an outpost like that, in the game somewhere, sometime, you have to expect it to be exchanged off. Now the question becomes, which pawn do we want to take? Because I'm telling you right now, seeing what I'm seeing and how passive he's playing, except this aggressive move. But, I mean, he's made moves over and over with his knight. He's made a few moves over and over with his bishop. I'm going to come at him on the king's side. I've already decided that's my plan for this game, king's side attack. So, what I decide to do is I don't want to give him a chance of start throwing pawns up here to do a queenside attack and a diversion to get a counterattack going while I'm in the middle of my kingside attack. So that choice, I want to keep this uh, unencumbered, that choice caused me to use the e-pawn to take the knight. Besides, it truly does, well, this file, it opens up this file. So I have the open file. My definition, I know you know this by now, I'm sorry I keep repeating it, but there's always new subscribers. I mean, I've almost had a hundred new subscribers since yesterday, which is astonishing. Thank you, I hope I'm worthy of your attention. But anytime I can open up a new file, and technically it's a good central file, I'm, I'm going to do that. Right? He is going to chase my knight off. Now, having said that, it helps me in a kingside attack to keep the center locked or blocked. So Nimzovich's principle of blockading a pawn with a knight came to my mind. And I said, oh, yeah, I mean, that's the obvious square to put the knight. It is on a, a, a nice outpost, but it also stops a lot of pawn movement up here on the king's side and in the center. So, well, more in the center, I mean. So, that's where I put the knight. And now watch what he does. Kablam! Nice! Developing a piece, hitting me, taking out one of my kingside pawns that I've castled over by, and threatening my rook. That's, ooh. So, who's doing the kingside and who's getting kingsided? Yeah, all of a sudden... Are the tables being reversed on me? Son of a gun, man! This is serious business, man! And then he puts it to F4. <laughs> I, 
it, it's playing somewhat passive. And, and we will have players that do this, pawn grabbing, bear, bear, and then go back into safety. You've had those. I mean, heck, we've been those, right? But I would have left it there. There's no way. I, I would have, oh, boy. I would have done a full-fledged kingside at this point. But he didn't, so I did. Here's the key. If he, He's playing passive. Here, he's got a great start. And I've got news for you. I'm dead in the water if he does this. Holy crap. There's no way I'm taking that not that bishop. No way. Not with his queen here. Uh-uh. I, I mean, I'm in trouble right there. I am in serious. I would, uh, oh, crap. I, I would start sweating bullets with that. So the thing is, he came back to here. So I have a passive player. That means I have to get aggressive right now, right? Oh, and then my heater interrupts me. Hang on, I'll be right back. Oh, the things I do for my beloved fans. Ooh, that almost sounds arrogant, doesn't it? Sorry. Okay, so what was I lying about before I was so rudely interrupted? Oh, his passivity. That tells me it's time for me to put the uh, accelerator down and let's go. Let's get on with the attack right now. And I'm ready right now. I truly am. My first goal is Bishop H4. First, I'm going to establish myself on his king side, right? And he pushes F3. Very interesting. I need all my pieces in, so I'm willing to make that king move because I want to slide everything over here I can and come right up at the king. Yes? And you say, well, you can't. The, uh, the aisle is clogged. That's why bishop sacrifices work so well in kingside attacks. That's why knight sacrifices work so well in kingside attacks. Sincerely, they do. So here we go. And he bumps up to queen d2, giving some oomph to his bishop because his bishop was hanging, so now his bishop is connected. I don't, I don't see how that can be gotten to, and I don't even care to. I'm not even worried about that. I want to attack the king. Therefore, I have to get to him, right? So this is one way you can destroy the king's structure. Now look at this. Bishop b4, he's beginning a counter offense. Uh, lots of grandmasters tell you if you can pull it off and if you pull the trigger fast enough and if you hurry, 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 hurry and attack on the other wing, you might be able to get some resources that are being used in a kingside attack over to the queenside attack so that I have to begin defending my queenside. This is exactly what I was trying to prevent by taking with my e-pawn, not my c-pawn, right? So I've kept the center closed, but he can still come down. So here we go. Do I all of a sudden realize, oh crap, uh, I've got queenside problems. Do, do I try to retake this pawn and then open this guy up? and retake that pawn and start getting the queen and the knight into here, uh, what do you do? The best advice that I have ever read on this is from international master Jeremy Silman. And he says, you completely ignore it if it's not critical. So, a judgment call has to be made. Is that pawn push critical to getting me in trouble on the queen side and the simple answer is no not even close so completely ignore it it's going to come to nothing continue on with my king side attack see the joy of reading the grandmasters and the international masters I'm, I'm just saying this makes for good practice now I want to go queen d8 
because I have a real nice file here and I have a real nice slice to the king side instantly. Okay, so this is one, two, three pieces in. Nice. So far, so good. It's going well. He brings rook A to C1. Um, not quite sure what that accomplishes, but he made the move. I need to open something up. The king side. So I'm going to... And my pawns are in my way. So I need to do some pawn pushing myself on the king side, just like he's trying to do on the queen side. Now, here is a fun observation to see, and it happens lots of times. Understand this. I am not reacting to him. I am going ahead and playing my game. And now when I pushed my f5, where did he move? On the king side. He is reacting to me, to my play. This is how you want your opponent to do. What in in another way of expressing this is I have the initiative. I'm pushing my agenda. I want to do a kingside attack, so I'm going to do the kingside attack no matter what you do anywhere else, unless this becomes somewhat lethal. If my queen was actually threatened from this, then I would have to get her out of danger, right? So I would have to react. What is White's reaction is the proper term here. He pushes the g3 pawn. He came back over on this side, and he is reacting to me. That tells me I have the initiative. Does that make sense? See, the initiative is kind of hard to discuss because it's nothing physical. Uh, you can't see it on the chessboard. You can only see it through the process of time and how you play, or how your opponent plays, yes. But you always want to have the initiative. Well, and you say, well, you ding bat, you shouldn't have reacted. <laughs> well, I, yeah, oh, the hypocrisy. Yes, I did have to react, and I will show you why, because it helps me. Now, he takes my f5 on my king side. He didn't take this and then this, or take this and start pushing the pawn down, or moving the knight further into my territory, or bringing the queen through. No, he's playing over on my side now. So I know he is reacting to my aggression against his king side. Therefore, I have the initiative at this point, because I'm doing this the way I want to do it. Yes? Bishop takes f5. <sighs> Let's see, that was move 24. Let's, uh, let, let's do something. If I would have retaken with the pawn, can you see the difference in the, the, the issue? One, I open up my king on a file. Granted, his pawns and his rooks aren't going to be to me and all that. That's not the point. That is not my point. This move, while it does remove the offending pawn, does nothing else. Uh, it's even blockaded by the bishop. So, that's a dead end way to retake since I am attacking the king. Does that make sense? So rather than responding by taking the pawn, by taking with the bishop, that is much more useful for my kingside attack, 
one, I hit this guy, not that I care about him, but two, I hit this guy, and I absolutely care about him. That's a weak pawn, man. My next move is taking that pawn. You see that? So there's the difference between, you know, sometimes we ask ourselves, how do I know how to retake? Well, what is your plan? What's your agenda? What is it you're trying to accomplish? Uh, which imbalance are you enhancing? See, I had more central space, and now I'm getting more kingside space, so I'm proceeding to push even harder, right? So in this instance, it made beautiful sense to retake with the bishop not the pawn. But I initiated this by pressing my f5 pawn in the first place. So I am creating a kingside attack by removing junk in the way, to use the metaphor, right? Does that make sense? Well, His reaction tells me that he knew what I was going to do. Somehow this computer app read my mind. <laughs> don't tell me the computer apps don't know how to read a position. That position said, your H-pawn is being really seriously threatened. So now it's covered, and this is covered, and this is covered, and this is covered, and the king is protected, and things are well. I haven't removed the obstacle. And, and I'm making too big a deal about this because you see the next move. There's no question you see the next move, so let me make it without further ado. Now it's time for the bishop sacrifice. Kablam. <coughs> Excuse me. Not the rook. Now, there's kingside attacks where you do sacrifice the rook, yes, but not this one. No, not yet. No. I want that rook there. I don't need the, the bishop. The bishop is a much better piece to sacrifice in this instance. Does that make sense? Now, again, not the rook but the queen that would be the proper piece to retake with because if you've got a rook back up on an open file going after a king man spearheading it with the queen is truly venomous that's the way to do it right that makes much better sense. Now he's in trouble. And I think he knew it. So he takes the knight. Check. Yeah. So I retake the bishop. In this instance, because of that exchange, I was in check. I'm virtually forced to react to him, of course. But that doesn't take away my initiative. Now this position is lost entirely. I've got the game. In fact, I even saw how I'm going to do the checkmate from this point, which was cool because I can only usually see a half a move ahead. This time I saw a couple. It was really cool. It was exciting. See, my chest brain is growing in strength. Yes! Awesome, Bubba! So I responded here. And then, where'd that piece go? He moved his rook to the side because he knows he has to have room. Because he knows I'm coming right to there. Check. Right? That makes perfect sense. If he wouldn't have moved the rook, he'd have been in trouble. Trouble. So the king comes up to here. Now, you can't. You can, but don't. Uh chase him with the queen. No. You bring the rook. That's why I opened the file in the first place and moved the rook over. Check. 
I knew I had the escape square covered. So he's only got this square to go, right? And now anybody in their dog can see the checkmate that I've got on him. One move, checkmate. And the game is over. <laughs> Sorry. Look, I have to make fun of myself, right? No, of course I didn't do that. I came up to here, checkmate. <sighs> there for a minute you guys thought you had me, didn't you? So there's your your chessercise. There's my chessercise and, and one of my training games where it's it's giving me a chance to practice pattern recognition. You know, they say the difference between a master and a grandmaster is a grandmaster has 10,000 more chess patterns built into his head because he's played that many more chess games. And that's what we're trying to do is develop uh, chess patterns, knowledge of understanding how pieces will coordinate either on files or with diagonals, uh, with the L shape of the... Look at this. His queen side never amounted to anything, so I was perfectly safe in ignoring it and continuing on with my process. I kept the initiative, in other words. I did not get distracted. His piece is way over here on the side. No good. His, his rook, yeah, he developed it, but unfortunately the majority of his material was on that side of his king, right? And that was another reason for my impetus to come to the king's side. Oh, and I did lie. I didn't get all my pieces into the attack. See, that cost me 500 rating points. I'm a complete phony because I didn't bring in the next piece. Dang it, man. I hate it when that happens. Now I'm going to have to play another 75 games and win to gain those 500 rating points. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you a little secret. I got this from Ben Feingold on YouTube also. Everyone is so enhanced, entranced, hypnotized with this idea of having a high rating. Now, rating is an indication. It's good. I mean, if there's a player that's rated 2200 that I have to play in the tournament, I, that's gonna make me sweat compared to if there's a guy like me at 1100 that I have to play. But rating is not everything. It's an indicator. It's not a proof. Yeah? <laughs> Lower rated players beat higher rated players all the time. So don't be obsessed so much with rating so much as training ourselves to seeing how to move pawns in so many different positions. To make sure we keep our pawns bunched together as much as possible. The power of a pawn. Uh, where to place our kings during an attack, say, or some other phase. So we are more interested not in our rating, but in our ability to absorb, use, and understand not only the imbalances, but all of the different patterns of checkmate, of uh, tactics, which I still suck at, and I always will, until by the end of this year. <laughs> hey! Come on, a guy can be optimistic. God, what are those guffaws I hear out of all of you guys? Oh, that's my own echo behind me. Whoops. Anyway, thanks for watching my video. That's a, a training game. I'm, I'm trying to do these. I'm going to attempt to do something that just, I think, could really work. Seriously, it's fun. And actually, I'm starting to get suggestions in the comments. And I'm going to try this. Um, I think it would be a blast. <sighs> You're just going to have to be patient with me. I haven't given up showing Grandmaster games yet either. I still love commenting on Grandmaster games. I'm much better with, and I'm st that doesn't mean I'm any good, but I'm much better with analyzing and discussing uh, Grandmaster games with hindsight than I am actually playing games myself, of course. I've got the natural gift of gab. I consider it a gift. Hopefully I don't overuse it and abuse it, which I think I do sometimes. I think what would be fun, but I'm not going to do it until starting in February. I'm going to give myself a few weeks to, to work into this and practice this. I'm going to play my training games with my chess app 
live for you as a video. And what I'll do, and a training game isn't necessarily about winning or losing. A training game is more giving us practice to, say, put our rooks on open files and attack a king. So if you've, a training game helps us see what is the results, what would, we ask the question, what if, what would happen? How would the app react if I did this? And what is the consequence to my position? And then you take back a couple of moves. Now, I didn't take back any moves in this one. This one, I just played a game. But if we take it back a few moves and then we say, instead of doing that move, what would have happened if we would have taken the pawn and sacrificed the bishop? I'm just doing hypotheticals, right? So a training game gets us the ability to see consequences of our choices. And that can be really good training. I've been doing that a little bit, and I am having a ball with it. I think I'm going to try to do some of that live with the app and show you how the app reacts. And then it'll help us do some pattern recognition. And it'll also help us understand, okay, hey, hey, wait a minute. I did this, and he did that, and that left a weakness. The one cool thing I'm discovering about my app, and you guys already know this, but the thing I'm discovering is my app always zeroes in on a weak spot in my game, and it attacks it mercilessly, just like it did when that bishop came down and took that h6 pawn. That was a weakness, and it just, bam, it zapped right out there but it didn't follow up the way I would have. But then I was in a much, much lower rating. If we do some training videos live with the app, we can change the settings so that the app will react differently. In other words, we can actually train ourselves practicing an imbalance with the app on full power and check out various different ways to approach the game. That's how variations are described in the Grandmaster descriptions of their games, isn't it? Yes, I did. I did this and that and thus and so, but he could have done Queen C3 and then I would have had to do whatever and whatever. So the app will be able to teach us and show us different variations and their results. And if we see something that looks promising, we can keep following it through eight or nine or ten moves until we either blow it or we win. And then we'll learn, ah, that was a good variation in that particular opening. And if after eight or nine moves you're losing or you're in a bad position, then just back it up the eight or nine moves and try something different. And then we'll talk, we, I can talk, through it with you while I'm doing my app live. That could be some potentially outstanding video instruction, in my opinion. So anyway, there's your chess video. More games coming up. Uh, I had a request to do the Fisher-Geller game. Oh, I, I, oh, oh my gosh, that's mana for Wii chess players. That's coming up after this one. Uh, I, I definitely want to play this game and talk about it. That is a splendiferous game. So, thanks for watching my videos. Appreciate all the support. Uh, appreciate all my friends. You guys are the greatest. I suck, but thanks for sticking with me. I will improve. I am improving, actually. But it's a lot of fun, isn't it? Chess is a lot of fun. Hey, there's an aphorism. Chess is like life. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> On the other hand, if you're losing all the time, chess is like life. It sucks. But you can do something about losing chess. Therefore, 
you can do something about losing life, too. Right?